Hello and welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast. Now, people that know me know that I'm not in favour of the macho sales technology hunter, crushing quota. You know, even the word close symbolises a sale being made rather than the beginning of a relationship and partnership. Now, there is one exception to this, the perfect close. It is sublime and simple, but I'll let its author tell you more about that. James Muir is founder and CEO of Best Practice International and the number one best-selling author of The Perfect Close. James is a 30-year veteran of sales, having served in every role to executive VP. Now, his mission is to make complex simple. James has an extensive background in healthcare. He has sold to and spoken for the largest names in technology, healthcare, and the, this includes HCA, Dell, IBM, and many, many more. So welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast, James. Thanks, Janice. It's great to be on. <laughs> it's really great to um, see you again. I know you know when I finished your book, I was uh, tweeting about it because I was really, really impressed. So it's <laughs> a real honor to, to have you on. You're, now, very, dil you're very, very diligent to tweet while you're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, if, if anyone's interested in uh, to learn a method where closing is zero pressure. And the are only two questions that you need to ask and then you'll get 95% success. Now that's brilliant and it's really so simple. Yeah. So James, I'm really interested in how you came up with those two magic questions. Well, so it actually started um, and as an individual contributor. I struggled for a long time trying to figure out a way to close. And I actually practiced a whole time. I have every closing book you can think of. And, and a huge percentage of these books actually come from the timeshare industry where they're, they're, they have a very limited time, basically one visit. And, and so they will try the most ridiculous tactics to try to get people to uh, purchase a, a large scale item. Um, and so the, the, the number of manipulative techniques is just astounding, actually. Someday I'll, write, I'll create a wall of shame that has all these unbelievable closing tactics on it. One of them is actually called the, the what would Jesus do atomic bomb close. And I'm, I mean, I, and I've got tons of these and they're just like unbelievable. And um, I was actually dumb enough originally when I first got into sales to actually try some of these things and they backfired on me. So um, ultimately what I ended up doing is I ended up with the second half. Of, I, I, by accident, I discovered a, um, well, you know, well, what's a good next step, as, which is the second close of the perfect close. And so I used that for a lot of years. And then when I got into management and started managing my own teams, I recognized that they were struggling with the similar type of a thing. And so that's when we uh, crafted the first question of the perfect close, which is a little more, um, it's proactive. You're trying to coach the customer through a process if they're not familiar with the process. I'm in typically in high, high stakes uh, IT sales for healthcare organizations, hospitals and things. And so they're very complex sales. There's lots of steps. And so these, most of these manipulative techniques absolutely backfire. And that's what the data shows too. And so we just, um, but the reason I bring that up is, is clients typically purchase what we were selling maybe once in a lifetime. So they actually don't have a lot of experience in how to, to, to purchase it. And so our suggesting of next steps is actually very facilitated for them because they don't know really what's a good next step. And so for us to suggest the next step um, and see if it makes sense for them, and if it doesn't, then we'll throw it back to them and say, well, right, what do you think is a good next step? Because they know their internal processes. They know mm -hmm. their internal buying steps better than we do. And so, you know, we can be as facilitative as, as we can, but in the end, the customer, you know, is the one that's in control. And so we want to just facilitate them getting what they want at, at the pace that they want to do it so that it doesn't feel like it's a high pressure thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's actually how the, 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 the second question came first. And then the first question uh, came later when I started managing my own teams. So, so give us the two questions and then the variations around it. Sure. So maybe before we share the questions, it's important to um, uh, state this, and that is, you know, before we go into any interaction, 
it's important that we have a couple of outcomes in mind. I mean, what do we really want to happen as a result of our interaction? And what we should have is we want to have an ideal advanced. And, and maybe if your audience isn't familiar with the term advance, uh, an advance is basically moving the cell forward in a little way. That's a, a, a phrase coined by Neil Rackham. And so what we want is we want an ideal advance, that is what's the best step to move forward. And we wanna have a couple of alternative advances, little back, you know, backup steps that we could suggest just in case the first one doesn't appear you know, realistic for the customer for some reason. And so once you've got those prepared, then you're ready for the two questions. And uh, the two questions are very simple. The very first question is, does it make sense to X? Right, where X is our ideal advance. So if we said something like, hey, does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment? to see what our best options are. Well, the, the assessment in that example is the X, right? And so really there's only two things they can say. They can say yes, or they can say no. And they say, yeah, it does make sense. Then great, we're off to the races. We got our ideal advance, right? And, and, and we'll get our calendars out. If they say no, then there's, there's several different variations, but the, the kindergarten version is just to ask that question that I used for so many years when I first got into sales, which was, okay, well, what, what do you think is a good next step then? Okay, and what I can tell you after doing hundreds of ride-alongs with sales professionals is, is that in 90% of cases, the customer will actually just suggest a very logical next step for where they're at in their buying process right now. Okay, and by doing that, we're, we're pacing the sale at exactly the rate that the client's ready for. And that's important because it's when we start to push them faster than they're ready for, that's when it starts to feel like manipulation to them. And, that, and as soon as they start feeling manipulated, what they do is they actually they withhold information from you, right? They're worried that you're gonna use that information against them when you're starting to pressure them. And so instead of sharing information and making the process facilitative, it starts to become sort of uh, counterproductive because they don't wanna share any information with you because they think you're gonna use it against them. And so now the whole sales process becomes much more difficult. So we don't ever wanna put them in a situation where they feel uncomfortable. So uh, those are the first two. Uh, then after that, there, we can, there's some little things that we can do to, to uh, boost it. Like you mentioned in the intro that it's a, it's 95% effective, right? So if I, if in 90% of cases, the customer recommends something, what do we do in that other, you know, five to 10% of cases? How do we up that? And so one of the things is just to add a little phrase at the beginning where we say something like other customers at this stage tend to do X, right? And so what we're doing is we're saying, you know, it's very logical at this stage to do this thing. Does it make sense for you to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's, uh, we call that the suggestion. And then if it turns out that that's not logical, we can use the suggestion in our fallback as well. We could say, oh, well, um, if that doesn't make sense, sometimes customers also do this other thing. Does it make sense to do that? And in that way, we can use one of the alternates that we prepared to um, suggest another logical next step for them. And of course, if that doesn't work, we can always just throw them the ball again. We can say, okay, well, what do you think is a good next step? So um, that's the, the fallback. The add-on is better, right? The, it's the most exciting and the best of all the ones because what happens is if the, if the customer says that our logical advance does make sense, right? Let's just say, hey, does it make sense for us to do X? And they say, yes. We go, okay, well, great. You know, other, other clients at this stage sometimes also do Y. Does it make sense for us to do that? And so we're adding on one of our alternate advances that we prepared in advance. And if they say yes to that, great. Then we could say, well, you know, some, sometimes they also do Z. Does it make sense to do that too? And um, if we run out of advances or if, um, if they say no, you could just throw them the ball and say, okay, are there any other logical steps that we should be considering right now? And that gives the customer an, op an opportunity to share, you know, some logical step that maybe we didn't even think of. And I'll, I'll tell you an experience that happened. I was working with this group in Sierra Vista, Arizona hospital, and uh, we thought we were demonstrating to the wrong people. Okay, so our ideal advance was to actually schedule a presentation with the executive team who we thought was going to actually make the, the purchase, you know, make the, the buying decision. And uh, so when it came time, I said, hey, does it make sense for us to, you know, schedule a demo for the rest of your team so we can get their input? And he goes, yeah, that's a great idea. And I'm like, all right, cha-ching, right? I got my <laughs> ideal advance. So uh, I look at my second advance. I said, well, you know, sometimes clients will want to have a, schedule a time for our technical people to meet so we can talk about the conversion and how much of your network we can leverage and all that. And it, does it make sense for us to schedule a time for our, our tech people to meet? He goes, yes, that is an awesome idea. My guys are really scared about that. Uh, so, um, so I'm like, cha-ching, wow, I got two for two, right? <laughs> And then I said, well, I think we've got everything we need to create a preliminary proposal for you all. Does it make sense for me to put together sort of a preliminary proposal so you can just get a feel for the scope of it? The guy says, yes, that would be awesome. And so I'm like, wow, three for three. I'm completely spent, right? So this, I, I said, well, all right. Well, are there any other logical steps we should be concerning right now, right? Which is how you end the add-on. And he goes, you'll never believe what he says. It's mind-blowing. He says, well, and he's, he kind of lowers his voice. He goes, you know, 
our legal people can be kind of slow. Is there any chance I could get a copy of your contract? And, <laughs> and like, you know, on the outside, I'm all calm and going like, well, of course, I'd be happy to get you a copy of the contract. Yeah. But inside, right, I'm going like, yeah, baby, are you kidding me? Of course I could get you a contract. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like the best moment ever. And so here this is just this amazing example of how we went in to this presentation thinking we're not even presenting to the right people. And yet we ended up with four advances, one of which we didn't even, you know, couldn't have even have dreamed of, which was sending a contract, right? So that is why... Um, the perfect close is perfect is we use the fallback to slow down if we need to slow down for the customer and we use the add-on if the customer's ready to speed up. Either way, what we're doing is we're just moving through the sales process at the rate that the customer's ready for and that's really what makes it perfect. Do you think you need to have a certain mindset in order to do this because you know it's interesting you said that you know on the outside you were going yes of course but on the inside you're going well hey <laughs> you know <laughs> I do think you need to have a mindset and the mindset is that we the we want we're just facilitating we really want to produce an honest value and a benefit for the customer and we want to do that at the rate that they're ready for and the way I like to think of it is is which you know who of us would not like to have anytime like we're, we're getting towards the end of the year people starting to think about new resolutions for next year we would all love to have a coach that would help coach us to get to our goal we all want that right and customers want that from their sales professional as well because if they could do it without you they wouldn't be talking to you <laughs> okay and so what they're what they want is they want us to to coach them through all the different little steps that it takes to get them to their final end goal and that's the way we, we our job as sales professionals is not to manipulate people it's not to persuade people a lot of people think that's what selling is is persuasion it's not persuasion what we are is we're coaches and facilitators helping the customer get to an end result and that very often involves one of our products or our tools sometimes it doesn't and we need to be ready to uh, when we see that that's the case, which actually uh, happened to me, I was working with a pharmaceutical company just last week and it just wasn't a, a fit. And so I said, well, you know, why don't we wait until it makes sense, but here's some folks I think that could help you with where you're at right now. And that's the attitude we need to take is to be of value regardless of what the outcome is gonna be in, the, in, in our meeting with the client. I've often um, worked with a, sell, a sales team and said, actually, you're in a better position if you recommend a customer to a competitor because they'll always want to come back to you they completely trust you you know you know and that's quite mind-blowing for a salesperson to actually do well, really let me, find that quite difficult really it is difficult but let me tell you it will pay and you just have to have faith because that's how it works right let's call it karma if you want or call it uh, law of attraction but i'll give you a crazy story so uh, i was working again in arizona this time uh, worth a with a clinic and it really just wasn't a match at all for what the solution that we had and so i just recommended some other folks and the woman i was working with was very grateful for that and literally two years later we get called up by a, a very large the largest health system in arizona and one of the largest in the entire west and they invited us to come and this turned out to be uh, i'll just long story short through a long process we ended up selling about five million dollars deal and then later they purchased another five million dollars uh, as a second roundup and so this it turned out this woman that i had recommended to a competitor recommended um this person their cio at this hospital system in arizona um and that's how we got invited to it so my walking away from a deal and just doing what was best for the customer yielded one of the largest deals our company had ever seen you know a total of about 10 million dollars over a course of a few years um, just because we we're doing the right thing. So if you're ever wondering, does it, does it pay? It does pay. Yeah. But you, just, you just have to pay, have faith that uh, doing the right thing will, will produce the good results for you. Yeah, and, and actually trying to make a, a round hole fit a square peg, it will never work. It will just be grief not only for you, but for the customer, which is more important down the line. It, it just never works, does it? No, no. In fact, usually those, those customers that aren't a good fit that you try to, you know, like you said, put a square peg in a round hole, they end up complaining the most. They're the highest maintenance customers. They won't recommend you. And yet, if there's a secret to selling, in my opinion, it is to just to do excellent work for a customer and have that customer recommend you to other customers, have them help you find other clients. If you do it that way and you always do great work, then what will happen is you'll get to the point where you don't even have time for prospecting because your customers are always feeding you more and more business. But that can't happen if you are willing to sell a deal for, for a non-fit customer. Right? Yeah. They'll never recommend you because it's not a good fit.
no no so you mentioned about um uh, coaching and you know looking at the how the dynamics have changed between the relationship between buyers and, and sellers what's your your view um well, i'm not sure i'm connecting there with the uh in terms of uh, what's happening now in uh, the relationship between buyers and sellers as opposed to years past yes yes because oh. it wasn't a, a kind of coaching consultative relationship so you know how are things now and how are they moving in in um in the future where do you see it going oh my goodness well so telling is more challenging today than it's ever been before and and the reason for that there's a bunch of reasons for that but uh, three of the biggest reasons are first of all marketing message overload there's too much messaging out there um i, th I think the latest data shows that we're all getting exposed to somewhere around ten thousand sales or marketing messages every day and you don't get hit with that many messages without putting up some defenses right like we were talking before that we started all your alerts are turned off on your phone right and so that means that those channels aren't good for you because you've got your defenses up so the other is uh, uh it, the internet as customers really prefer to go check things out on the internet before engaging with a salesperson for for better or for worse that's exactly what's happening and then um diminishing attention spans is uh, one that's very interesting and how that affects us is when we finally do get a message to someone it has to be super tight and concise because they're not going to give you more than a few seconds. And so you can't beat around the bush. You got to get, you make sure that your messaging is very tight. All of those are big barriers that didn't exist before. And because of that and other reasons, it's really important that sales organizations and sales professionals are focusing on the highest leverage areas that they can um, in their selling efforts. And uh, unfortunately, most of the time, they're actually not utilizing the highest leverage areas. And there's four key areas that they should be doing. Um, and just to keep them all easily memorized, I use M words for that. So it is a market, which is who we're targeting. There's message, what's the message we're gonna do. Um, there is a mecha or mechanism that is, the, what's the channel we're gonna use to reach them. And then there is mo uh, motivation. How do we keep them motivated? Um, and we could spend a lot of time on each of those four channels, but the, because of those barriers, each of those four things is really where we should be. If we just spend a little more time focusing on who we're gonna sell to, so we don't sell to, to um, non-fit clients, um, you can get massive improvements. Um, uh, Hill Rom actually, just by changing who their salespeople um, were selling to in a single year raised, uh, sold 70 million more than they had the previous year and they didn't change anything. There were no new products, no new anything. They just changed who they were focusing on. And so just focusing on the right customer can have a massive difference. And um, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. I don't know if you want, we can do a whole thing on uh, market message, media motivation, but um, uh, the, all of those things uh, matter in a very big way because of the changes that have happened. Um, in you know what, in I think we years. need to do another uh, podcast because the listeners <laughs> won't know, we were talking for ages before we <laughs> recorded this, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll have to leave that one to the next one. So I'm going to book you in it in again. So talking about um, salespeople and the, the environment, um, tell me a bit more about diversity. How much do you think this impacts sales? And also, do you think that, you know, there, with, there's more for us to do? Oh yeah, we're way behind. Um, fortunately, in the organization that I'm in, um, we're fairly diverse. We have actually more uh, females working for us than we have males in our organization, which is good. Um, and we have quite a diversity uh, in, in ethnicities as well. So um, my opinion about that, I'm a fitness buff. I think you probably know that. Um, and there's like very brand new research around the microbiome that is our gut flora. And what the, the data is showing us is that a diverse gut flora is actually much better and much healthier for you than one that's focused in a certain area that with too much of one kind of strain of bacteria. And um, so I, that's the way I see diversity in the workplace as well. That, and and when, I, when I say that, what I mean is that none of us is as good as all of us. So what we need is we need that diversity because it's those different perspectives that allow us to see more clearly what's actually happening in this space. It's when we have just all one certain type of focus and one per kind of perspective, we, that gives us blind spots. And that's not representative of what our market is like and the people that we're working with. And so it's important that we have diversity in the, in the workplace so that we can apply that diversity of thinking to our approach to the messaging that we do to the products that we create you know to the to the way that we're engaging our clients and so um that's a it's a good thing the world has a long way to go to catch up to that 
I think to believe in that. I think it's natural for people to want everyone to be like them. And so um, it, a, a pitfall that managers fall into very frequently is they try to hire people just like them. Uh, but yet that will create the blind spots that we were talking about. Absolutely. Now, what's one tried and tested strategy? And I, I know that you've, you're, you've got an offer for us, haven't you? Um, I'm sorry, the which? One tried and tested strategy that you would offer the listeners, but I know that you've also got an offer for us. Oh, absolutely. So um, in terms of strategies, well, of course, the best one would be you, you should just change your closing approach. Instead of trying to use the manipulative techniques that are out there in all these different books, just use the two simple questions. They're, they're so easy. And we just gave you the whole secret here on this podcast, right? Is does it make sense for us to X? And what do you think is a good next step? That would be the, my top recommendation. Probably my second recommendation would be what we were talking about in terms of targeting. Um, I, I coach folks, uh, well, my job is to improve, improve close ratios. And so if you say, hey, what's the single best thing you can do to improve your close ratios? You might think it's to use the perfect close questions, but the truth is it isn't. The best thing you can do is to actually just target only ideal customers. Mm. And so identify what an ideal customer is for you and then don't waste your time with people that don't meet that profile. That will, increase, that will improve your close ratio probably better than anything else uh, that you can do. Um, and in terms of an offer, um, I'm happy to give any, uh, I think we've got five copies of the audio book that we can give to anybody that wants to uh, tweet using the uh, scale your sales hashtag and then you tag Janice and me and th that's so we can see it. <laughs> and then after that, we'll send you a direct message after that, and we'll send you a link to the audiobook of The Perfect Close, and then you can learn the whole story about The Perfect Close instead of just the two that we talked about on the show today. And I can tell the listeners this will be the best thing they did. You're going to love the book, and it's really going to revolutionize the way that you, you sell as well. So, you know, you've got to get onto this. It's brilliant. Thank you very much for offering us that. So last question, who is your hero or shero? So uh, my hero is Mahan Khalsa, and my book is, in fact, dedicated to him. And uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, he is the author of the book, Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Um, it is my favorite book of, this is my favorite sales book of all time. Uh, I would say its subject matter is uh, particularly relevant for people in the B2B space, but it does apply to everybody. And it's probably the best book on discovery uh, and critical thinking in sales that has ever been written. And that's, uh, that's my opinion of it. And, but uh, what, what Mahan Khalsa taught me is that intent matters more than technique does. And so we just taught you some technique on this show, right? We just taught you how to use the perfect close questions. But if you go into those, uh, into those meetings with uh, what I call commission breath, the customer is going to detect that. And so what we want to do is just, you know, get your intent out there in that your honest intent is just to try to help and to serve the customer. And if you do that, the customers will detect that. And even if you butcher the technique, if they sense that you're just trying to help, they will still come to your rescue and they'll give you multiple chances to swing at the plate. And so uh, that's the thing that he taught me the most. And uh, he is still my most revered hero. And when I get a call from him, it makes my day because he's a, an amazing individual. Excellent. And well, we'll also put the link in, um, in the show notes as well. So James, how can everyone get hold of you? Well, um, probably the best way is I'm very, uh, I, I post a lot on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly, since we're talking about Twitter, you can connect with me on Twitter. Um, my, uh, my handle is B2B underscore sales tips, and maybe we can put that in the notes. Uh, yeah. if, you're, if you don't mind seeing my personal stuff, you're welcome to connect with me on Facebook. There's not that many James Mears out there, so I'll be pretty easy to find. Um, and, uh, and of course, anybody that might want, they, can, they certainly can call me. If you, go to, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I don't hide my phone number. It's sitting right there in the summary, so you're welcome to give me a call. Excellent. And I'm sure people will. So thank you so much for being a guest on Scale Your Sales podcast, James. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm honored. Thanks, Janice, for having me on. We'll have to schedule the next one. We will. <laughs>